my definition of wealth started to change because it wasn't just about how much money I could spend or what's the most expensive thing I could buy. Mm -hmm. It started turning into what purchases can I make to increase the quality of my life and my family's life, specifically thinking about people like my mother because mm -hmm. she worked two jobs. She wasn't a W-2 employee. She was a contractor. So what does that mean? She doesn't have any sort of retirement set up for herself. The game plan is essentially social security, which isn't too much. And that's it. And that's where I started running into a bit of a problem with that. And I was like, okay, so even if in this world, I could buy this yacht, does that purchase make sense for me? Or would I rather use that money to do other stuff like make sure my mom is taken care of? What if you grew up in a low income household with a single mother working two jobs, but with sheer determination, you became a self-made millionaire in your 20s? What would you do with that knowledge, with that money? Would you choose to help others create wealth? That's exactly what my guest today chose to do. And he does it, as he says, without the BS. Welcome to Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson. I'm your host, best-selling author, award-winning podcast host, keynote speaker, and speaker coach. My goal for every episode is to elevate, educate, and motivate you personally and professionally, because when you rise, we all rise together. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell ya. you that fear. Magnifies the consequences of failure What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? I'd rather live like I'm dying than live to die Any day my heart is pure my soul is safe Welcome Eric! Thank you so much for having me. I'm stoked to chat with you. When I came across your uh, your podcast, I you know listened to a few of your episodes and I love your message. I love what you're about. I love what you're doing. So I'm so stoked to be here with you. Hey, I love what you what you're doing too. A modern day Robin Hood, only you're not having to rob anybody but the market. I like it. I like it. As I understand it, you have dedicated over 15 hours in 15 years and 21,000 hours of life learning, applying, and optimizing your incredible investing approach, which is outperforming the market with a 22.8% return from 2017 to 2021. Is that right? From 2007. So it's essentially, yeah, what that is, it's a compound annual growth rate. Mm -hmm. And it's a way that we could look at returns to see what you would need to make per year to have whatever original principle you invested be worth what it is now. Um, so yeah, so far it's been, been good to me and I'm, you know, really, really fortunate. I've met a couple of really impactful people throughout my life that have helped me stay on the right path. Um, because if I was just winging it on my own, I probably wouldn't have that result. And I'm very vocal about that because I don't feel like I'm anybody special. I'm just a regular dude out there. And because of other people helping me out, um, I was able to really change the trajectory of my life. I love that. I love that. And it's interesting to me, even now that so many people are so close fisted about, you know, investing and yep. wealth creation and generational wealth. It just it's it just boggles my mind. There's plenty of money out there. There's trillions of dollars. But just tell me a little bit more before we get into your approach. Tell me a little bit more about just your your background it it sounds like you had a really hard working mom i did and she is such a huge part of all of this and that's actually one of the reasons why i was so drawn to to your podcast is because mm -hmm. I think it's important for people, especially the mothers out there to under, I'm sure they understand already, but like the, the examples they provide literally set up their kids for the rest of their lifetime on how they approach pretty much everything. And right. the way yeah. that I, that I, the way that I approached money early on is we didn't have much. And unfortunately my mom wasn't really good with money. It wasn't her strong suit. And 
the thing that I saw from her was the hustle. She worked, man. She worked hard. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I got to a point where I was able to start working, I mean, I, I worked before I was in my teens mm -hmm. and I would just go find stuff to do around the neighborhood. I would go, I used to, um, I'm from New York. So I used to hunt on a neighbor's property and I would help him move shale and split wood and anything I could to, to make a few dollars and all of that. Well, started wait, wait, that doesn't go with anything. People in the South. Anyway, think about New York that I used to hunt. Uh -huh. <laughs> Work on what, what part of New York are you talking about? Cause I'm thinking yeah. Manhattan and, and Times Square. I'm not seeing wood chopping going on at all. Which is hilarious because most people, when they hear New York, that's exactly what they think. They right, think right. New York city and they forget there's a big old state of New York. So I was like 60 miles outside of the city. So not even that far outside of the city, but it's all woods. Yeah. There's, wow. it's a very, not, I wouldn't call it very rural, but way more rural than people think it is. All right. We have um, to, we have to have the setting, you know, I'm a writer, so we have to have the setting. So we're in rural New York folks. He's, mm -hmm. he's not in, not in central park <laughs> chopping yeah, down trees. <laughs> My mom actually grew up in the Bronx, so uh, I had family in the Bronx. I spent a lot of time in the city, uh, but yeah, I spent more of my life outside of the city, which I'm actually very thankful for. Yeah. But, but yeah, I pretty much started working all over the place as much as I could. And then I came across one of the first pivotal mentors of my life when I turned into ninth grade. And it was my junior ROTC instructor. I refer to him now as my stepdad. That's <laughs> how big of a role he has in my life. He was wow. literally out here like last month visiting me. So I'm 31 now and we're still that close. And he's the one that got me to start getting into investing. And, you know, from there, I just kept rolling. I have an obsessive personality. And as soon as I started seeing a glimmer of opportunity, mm -hmm. that's where I just started pouring all of my time and effort. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I love that ownership of the obsessive personality, you know, for so long, those of us who are pretty intense and passionate about things, we were viewed as, you know, something was wrong with us. And really, that that is quite how you get things done is to be obsessed about it and detailed oriented. And clearly, that's what's happened with you. And before I go to my next question, I do want to give you kudos for giving props to the moms because I had long said that we set the emotional tone, but I never really thought about how we can also set the uh, financial tone and attitudes of our family members. That is a very critical, important point. And I'm glad you're here with us to make these points. Let's start with the beginning. What, what does wealth mean to you and why does it matter? I love that question. And it's because it, that has evolved over time for me. Like when I was younger in my, my late teens, early twenties, wealth to me, I thought was just being rich, just balling out, being able to buy whatever <laughs> I want, just, you know, living the good life, mm -hmm. a ton of excess and a ton of spending. That's really what I thought wealth was. And as I started to, you know, change my paradigm a little bit and I got to a point in my life where, okay, I was reasonably able to afford just about anything I genuinely wanted. And I say genuinely wanted because I put some serious thought into like, do I seriously like want a yacht? Is that something that like I think would make a big difference in my life? And I thought about it because I didn't want to cross that off the list. I didn't want to say, oh, just because it's a big thing, it'll never happen. So let me manage my expectations. Mm -hmm. I gave myself that window to like truly consider it. And I started to realize like it wouldn't, it would be cool. Maybe, you know, rent one for a while or something, but I don't ever see myself being in a place where that would be huge value add. So my definition of wealth started to change because it wasn't just about how much money I could spend or what's the most expensive thing I could buy. Mm -hmm. It started turning into what purchases can I make to increase the quality of my life and my family's life specifically thinking about people like my mother, because mm -hmm. she worked two jobs. She wasn't a W-2 employee. She was a contractor. So what does that mean? She doesn't have any sort of retirement set up for herself. The game plan is essentially social security, which isn't too much. And that's it. And that's where I started running into a bit of a problem with that. And I was like, okay, so even if in this world, 
I could buy this yacht. Does that purchase make sense for me? Or would I rather use that money to do other stuff like make sure my mom is taken care of, make sure that she doesn't have to continue working if she doesn't want to. Mm -hmm. So my perception of wealth has changed a lot. And even now I'm, like you said, I'm 31 and it's even adapted further from being able to meet my needs and wants providing for my family and wealth has become more of a view of um, not just finances, but wealth in terms of who I surround myself, my relationships, my experiences. And I never would have thought my mind would change from wealth, being able to ball out, buy what I want to being worried about relationships. Right. But has been the progression. And I realized a lot of that came from when I grew up, quote unquote, without, and I use that hesitantly because even though I did grow up in a constrained environment, it's still far better than tons and tons of people out there. So this isn't like some sob story from Eric. I'm very thankful. I always had food to eat. It was never right. that bad. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I also didn't grow up in an environment with a lot of excess. Like I still remember I could walk into my bathroom and I could see a hole through the floor into the basement because we didn't have the money to fix that hole. So we put a blanket over it to hide it literally. Right. So, you know, that's, but I had a bathroom to go into, so not that bad. And, right. and running water, which so many people exactly. all over the world do not have. That's, that's the other thing that changes as you get a worldview and travel as you have is that you really get a good perspective on what is, what is poverty, what is poor, uh, and it, it changes you or it should if it doesn't. Yeah, I could not agree with you more. I think that same original mentor that I mentioned to you, actually, he's the first one that ever took me on a trip and mm -hmm. he took me my best friend. It was a great trip. We went to Italy. So oh, it's wow. not like we saw nice. this. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like <laughs> this. Uh, I did go to Africa too, which was fascinating. Love that trip. Um, I went to Tanzania and mm -hmm. I got to go see a lot of stuff there. And I've been to a bunch of different places at this mm -hmm. point, but traveling has been so impactful for me for literally that exact reason, because we in America are generally so fortunate. Mm -hmm. And most people, I think, don't even really know that until you have something to compare it against. Sure, right. you might be something on TV that says they got it real bad over here for some reason, but you don't really internalize that until you go there and you see those people and you interact with those people. And yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up the worldview perspective because I think for a lot of people, it's something that can change our lives in a pretty meaningful way. Indeed, indeed. Well, I, I, I really appreciate that you're sharing about your background because I, you know, when people say started from the bottom, now we're here. A lot of times they don't want to talk about the bottom, but that only mm. makes the here more relevant, you know, mm. uh, by perspective. It's just what you've overcome, not even where you are, but where you overcame, what you overcame to get to that point. And it's encouraging as well. So I think we've established this, but I'm going to ask the question because it's here. Why should people care about what you have to say? about finances. There's so many people out there talking about investment and financing and what what makes you different or, or what makes you relevant, as they say. Yeah, I think what I aim to bring to the table is kind of that realism behind the journey. And mm -hmm. when I was starting to look at finance, especially investing, like I said, literally in ninth grade is when I started. I had no context. I didn't know what was possible. I didn't know what could happen. I saw stories of rich people and I thought, okay, well, they had this advantage or that advantage, or they grew up with this around them, or I was always able to write it off and mm -hmm. essentially, you know, give myself a bypass because I didn't have that kind of environment. And my real goal is to share that literally every normal person that is fortunate enough to have internet access has the potential to start meaningfully affect their future. And a couple people I came across online really made me believe that. So now my goal is to be one of those people online, hopefully that mm -hmm. it connects with some people and it lets them know that there are a ton of different starting points out there. Again, mine wasn't great. Mine wasn't bad, but 
you can still make really meaningful change. And the other thing I just want to add to that is I really don't like a lot of the finance industry. It's very frustrating to me because most of the finance industry, as I see it, is predicated around preying on people's weaknesses and ignorance. And that really bothers me. And what I mean by that is most financial advisors out there or uh, money managers, they want nothing more than to separate you from your money so that they can insert themselves neatly in the middle and collect some of your money. And for some people, that's great because maybe you just don't have the time. Maybe you don't want to spend the time learning the skill set. No problem. But the finance world in general, they put these barriers to make it make it seem inaccessible. Mm -hmm. You have to learn all these terms and it's super complicated and you can't do it. That's what bothers me because literally everybody can do it. They just try to make it seem impossible, which is frustrating. I, I agree. And I, I've been happy to see the advent of different ways of investing, automatically investing, particularly uh -huh. for young people or fractional shares and the apps and the information and resources out there. But for us boomers, for the older generation who may have gotten kind of stuck on, okay, I've been at this company, I'm investing in my 401k, mm -hmm. they're matching, I got a couple of money market things going on. What would you suggest that they look at next in terms of, I know you talk about creating multiple streams of income, and my point being, I don't think it's ever too late to do that. I think a lot of people have been doing the same thing for so long or what their parents did. And that's what they know. What What are some other areas that you think they should look at in terms of creating multiple streams of income? Yeah, it's a great question. I think setting up individual uh, brokerage accounts is a, is a great way to go. So not necessarily tax advantaged like a 401k, but just a regular margin account if you're so inclined. Mm -hmm. And that's super easy. You just Google brokerage accounts and you look at the reviews, find one that you like, and then you can start looking at products called index ETFs, which mm -hmm. is a index exchange traded fund. And it's essentially similar to a mutual fund, but going back to my first exhibit of not liking finance in general, it just cuts out the manager of the mutual fund because they don't on average outperform the market. So it gives you direct exposure to broad market indices like you're used to hearing potentially like the S&P 500. You can look up SPY, that is the index ETF for the S&P 500. It's automatically balanced. There's a algorithm essentially that creates the right exposure. And then that's it. You have the S&P 500 now done. So I think, you know, doing an individual brokerage accounts, a great approach. And then beyond that, I think that's where it's really useful to start tapping into other skill sets that you have. I started with investing because the, the overhead is so low. You mm -hmm. just need to save some money and then you can start. If you want to start a business, which obviously you know a lot about that, you have to have overhead. There's a building, there's people, there's payroll, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be in place, which makes it harder to start cracking into it. Not impossible, but just right. harder. And it's a more dedicated effort. So I think for people to start looking at other ways that they can create assets or add money to their pockets, typically a good thing. The margin account's a good add. As soon as I could start getting into things like real estate, I did that. And that's been a meaningful way for me to create money. The market this year has been down. A lot of people are aware of that, at least in a broad sense. Right. And I made a quarter million dollars selling a rental house that I had for seven years, had renters in it paying my mortgage for me, and then I just offloaded it. So I found one of the most impactful things I could do is start finding other assets that help appreciate. Obviously, you have your podcast that you're doing now. You write books, right? You are a prime example, in my opinion, of that thought process of creating more streams of income. So I think the earlier people can get that approach going, the more time they get to enjoy the fruits of that labor. Sure, the lift up front might be a little heavy, but it's worth it. Thank you. And to your point, as you help people with investing, I'm a speaker and I became a speaker coach because people were coming to, to me anyway. My point being, if people are gravitating you, to you, constantly asking you about a particular area, you have a strength in that area. You have a skill set 
and it can be monetized. People clearly need what you have. You don't have to give it away. You don't have to take advantage of people, but you don't have to keep giving it away. And um, I just like this, this mindset. I know you're turning on some light bulbs for people and it is not a greed mindset. You, you're very community oriented and great about sharing what you know. Um, what about investing in others? I know you've done some angel investing. Um, how does that work? I, I think a lot of people, particularly boomers and millennials, other generations, I'm not saying other, other people don't have money, but you, you get to a point in your life as you get older, typically, where you want to start you know, pouring into other people. How do you get into angel investing as opposed to just giving that nephew money who never does anything with it or pays you back. So I'm sorry, that was a personal thing. How do you, <laughs> had, a, had a flashback. How do you, <laughs> how does angel investing, angel investing work? That's something I know nothing about. And I was, I was, it piqued my interest when I saw that you, you'd done that. Yeah, I got into it more by happenstance than anything. And then I just, again, saw opportunities. So I started pursuing it. The way I got into it is um, when I was in college, actually, is really where I start, where I started, quote unquote, angel investing in my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I had a buddy that was a mechanic. So I would buy the cars for him to fix. He would fix the cars. We would split the profits on the car that was broken, fixed, now out the door. And I started realizing like, hey, that's actually kind of fun. And it gets me exposure to lots of different kinds of business. So as I was doing well, thankfully investing, I was building more capital, looking to put capital to work in different places. My friends and family knew you know, about investing because I do this. I like to talk about it because it's helped me a lot and I think it can help other people. Mm -hmm. So a couple of my friends would start to come to me with different business ideas. And that's the very first like true contract. And this is when I was in college that I entered with somebody. They were opening up like an entertainment business in Dubai. And it was a sibling of a family friend. So I created a contract with them. And essentially I helped create uh, financing for them as well as providing consultation for the services. And then we just sketched out an agreement from there. And that was a really formative experience for me because it was not a very clean ride. There were a lot of issues throughout the, the journey. And it taught me quite a few things about the nature of investing in smaller entities like that, but it didn't dissuade me. It just made me more interested in being selective and what to look for. I like to talk about angel investing because I think it gets people familiar with the idea of being receptive to business deals and opportunities, but it is super risky, super, super risky. Right. And I think it's important to note that because I would never put any money in angel investing that I'm not comfortable literally completely losing every single penny. And, and I'd say that for all investing, but I don't like to make assumptions with the audience in the event that there is someone listening who's not familiar with the term angel investing. Mm. Would you define it, please? Yeah, for sure. So angel investing, there's different shapes and forms of it, but essentially it's when we add assets to a business that's looking to grow by non-conventional methods. And what I mean by that is if I own a ice cream truck and it's doing well, and Eric, the ice cream truck owner wants to buy two more ice cream trucks, maybe I don't have good finances, or maybe the bank loans are really annoying to get, or the rates are too high, so on and so forth you can not get a loan from a bank. You can get a loan from a human being like me. And we'll talk about whatever you have going on. I will go through my own due diligence process. And then I can invest in your ice cream truck business. Sometimes it'll take the shape of just hard money lending where I give you X number of dollars at a certain rate. We agree on a payback period and then that's it. Sometimes it turns into equity of your company if you are looking for that kind of agreement. So angel investing is really fascinating because it's kind of like a blank slate. It's up to you to talk with that other person to create a deal. 
Now, if you're not so business inclined or don't want to go through that entire process, there are things called investing syndicates out there. And essentially, there's it's almost like a hedge fund manager. It's a dude or a dudette that is looking for angel com companies that are looking for angel investors. And they do the due diligence on your behalf and you provide capital. And then maybe you get equity, maybe you get money back again, depending on how the individual agreement's broken out. But syndicates are a great kind of intermediate. And there's even just like investing platforms, there's even platforms out there for syndicate investing that makes it really easy to find those kinds of opportunities. But angel investing is really a non-conventional way to get into investing. But I think for those people with a little more time, a little more resources, free resources that they're willing to put to higher risk, but potentially a great effort, it's a really cool place to, to learn about different businesses. And that's my favorite part is you get so much exposure to various businesses and it's a blast. Right. And, I, and when I helped others, whether it was being an angel or not, I the one of a couple of things that I look for, because they may not always have had, like you said, the best uh, credit, something could have happened or whatever. What If they don't have good credit, I do want to know what happened, but also looking for a business plan and experience because so many people have really great ideas and obviously it's hard to get experience if nobody will hire you and all of that. But depending on what they're doing, I, I've found those to be very, very critical. And and who are their partners? Would you say those are some factors that you assess when you're looking uh, to invest or because you said you learned a lot from that first experience? Yeah, 100%. I think in terms of the business plan, I am a little more lenient depending on what other documentation they have, aka finances. Another thing that I, it is a must. I have very few black or white, it's got to be or it doesn't happen kind of things sure. in my life. I'm very gray area on most things, but a got to be is investment from the person I'm investing in. If I ask you, you know, you're asking me for a hundred thousand dollars to put into your business. And I ask you, okay, fine. How much money have you put in? And if they say I, I put in $2,000, it's not happening. It's already a no from me because right. if you are not even sponsoring your own idea, how on earth am I going to sponsor it in addition to? So that has been like one of the bare bones thresholds. And maybe that person that's asking for a hundred thousand dollars only put in two, I'll say, okay, how are you coming up with these numbers? If your business is at this point, you only put in two, I'll maybe give you 10. And you know, is that even in the world? So it's like, if I see some sort of sponsorship from the business owner, I am far more receptive, even if the numbers are kind of out of whack, but if it's ever a zero or a really low number, like that example I gave you, it's a 100% no from me pretty much every single time. Right. That classic skin in the game kind of thing. And, and I do appreciate the show Shark Tank for exposing people to how investors think and how you should think as an investor, particularly when it, I don't I think a lot of people know a lot, understand equity a lot more now than they did before. You know, that right. that program and, and how that can be a value to you as well, particularly if they've got a good idea, you know, it, it, right. to, to get in there for the long term. So. Good deal. Good deal. What are the traits that set you apart from other people? I think about this pretty regularly because I view myself as a very normal person, not unexceptional in just about every single way. Mm -hmm. But there are two things I think I've done that as I look at my peers, I realize why I'm in a different position than most of them. The first one is... I took the first step. I found after talking to a lot of my friends that they're waiting. They're waiting for the right circumstance to do something, to take a risk. Mm -hmm. And you can wait a long time, if not forever, before somebody truly feels comfortable doing something. So by taking that first, ex that first step, I acknowledge that I'm going to make mistakes, that I'm going to look stupid, that I'm comfortable looking not good doing something that I'm trying to figure out in a big way. And by enabling myself with that right mindset, guess what? The person that's going to have something to show, whether it be experience, output, or both, 
It's not the person sitting there watching the basketball game. It's the person in there playing the basketball game, gaining the skill set, learning how to progress. Right. So I think that's the first one. And then the second thing is I really do not like the idea of motivation. I think motivation comes, motivation goes. We mm -hmm. feel good, we feel bad. I have really embraced the concept of discipline. And what I mean by that is whether I feel like doing something or not truly is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I know I need to do in order to progress something. And I think that has served me really well, at least in my endeavors. That's not the right fit for every endeavor, but for most of my endeavors that are very just math based, mm -hmm. discipline has served me very well because there's plenty of days that I don't feel like doing something, but that's not the right answer to just say, oh, well, I don't feel like it today, so I'm not going to. You're giving ourselves a little too much slack there and too much of an out, especially once we understand like the psychology of the human brain and how much our subconscious just wants to seek comfort. We don't want to feel like we're going to look stupid because we have a thing called an ego that really doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to put those other orders in place so that we can achieve our higher level objectives. And I think applying discipline has been probably one of the most important things that um, has separated me, at least from a lot of my peers. I would, I would agree with you that consistency, resilience, that inner that inner thing that drives a lot of us is is very, very important. I think there's a place for mo motivation, but if you're not internally, exactly. if your mindset isn't right, then you know, you're not going to be consistent. You're not going to keep it up and nothing is going to last if you don't keep it up, whether it's your podcast or writing your book or your exercise plan, you've got to dedicate yourself to making it happen and figuring out whatever it takes. That's what I'm going to do. And Obviously, that's what you've done, Mr. Millionaire, before you were 30 years old. That that in your 20s, that's that's really, really impressive, especially now. I mean, that that was easier to do in, in generations past. Uh, it's gotten exceedingly difficult, even with the advent of more technology. But I think there's more stuff pulling at you, Eric, just more things yep. to distract you from that discipline uh, that is so very important. Well, here's a fun question before we go. Well, two, let's start with what is an outlier? Because I know that's your tagline, be an outlier. I can't I can't miss that one. What, what does that mean? It's a fun one. So I really like the idea when I look at a brand or I look at something that there's meaning behind the choices they've made. And for me, the reason why uh, the tagline be an outlier is because the vast majority of people statistically fall into a certain bracket in terms of overall happiness, but then also financial success. Mm -hmm. So the tagline be an outlier is designed to be a reminder for us that it is an active choice for most of us. If we want to pursue breaking out of that norm that a lot of people are in. And for some people, they're happy with kind of their status quo and totally cool. I think happiness is probably the most important measure but for the people that are trying to achieve outsized performance, you got to put in the work. So the entire idea behind that is to reinforce that concept that it is possible for us to break away from what everybody else is doing, from where everybody else is settled and mm -hmm. achieve our level of success, but requires work. It does require work. Did, did I read that you're a veteran or did I make that up in my head? Yeah. But which branch of the military? Uh, I was in the Marine in the Marine Corps for six and a half years. Okay, sweet. Is that Semper Fi? I don't know my my yeah. say Semper Fi. Look at me. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> most of most of my family were Army people going back for generations. But uh, mm -hmm. mad respect. Thank you for your service. And I do not say that lightly. It's it's critical to our our safety globally and in our nation. Thank you for that. Here's uh -huh. my. Here's my fun thing I made up. What is the first thing someone should do if they suddenly come into a large sum of cash, a, a windfall, a huge bonus, or a lottery win? What would you recommend? What are the first two or three things? Because so often we see people just just blow it away. You know, yeah. what, what would you say? 
two things. First one, pay off any high interest debt that needs to go away. Number two, pretend you don't have it, invest it in a index ETF like SPY and move on. Pretend that you never even saw it. A lot of people, I think they see money and they get to just, they look at it and they're like, oh my goodness, I could buy all this stuff with this. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have this nice, you know, windfall, but then you just start carving bits out for all these little things that you think you want. And I have actually people close to me that I know came into a windfall and did exactly that. And it was so frustrating to watch, but it's also, you know, a good, I'm a practicer of stoicism in a big way. And that's outside of my control. I still love them as a friend. They're very close to me, but don't agree with that decision at all. Huge wasted opportunity. But I think those are the very first two things. High interest debts got to go away and then invest it. Pretend you never saw it. Sweet. I'm going to add a number three from a few years down the road. And that's going to be don't tell anyone <laughs> that you oh. came into this huge windfall because they start pulling at you. Folks start pulling at you. There are a lot of people out there with wants that are not needs who will start pulling mm -hmm. at you. So keep it to yourself while you, while you, you know, putting it away, tucking it away. So this <laughs> has been wonderful. A lot of fun. I know that you've got a whole plan, a whole program. You're on YouTube. Guys, you got to subscribe to his YouTube channel, uh, Twitter, esinvest.com. But I will let you tell folks specifically your handles and how to connect with you and get more great. I promise you guys, it's, it's even better than this. I just didn't have the time or the knowledge to go in depth with them with him as I would like to. But if you're really in, interested in wealth creation and understanding all these vehicles for doing so, you got to get with Eric Invest. That's exactly it. So it's ES Invests. I keep it real simple. Those are just my initials, um, real original, but it's that exact thing across all handles. So I'm on Twitter there and at YouTube. And that's exactly it. On YouTube, a little more technical so you know for the people that are really wanting to get in the weeds that's the right place for you and then twitter i try to keep it a little higher level and talk about finance concepts and wealth concepts that i think are important so yeah those are really the two main places for me all right it has been a great pleasure thank you for your time and we will definitely have you back because there's so much more that you have to share and uh i'm gonna promote the heck out of this episode because Folks need to hear what you said today. Thank you so much for having me. You're rad. I'm stoked on what you're doing. I'm really happy to be a small part of it and looking forward to seeing you continue to grow. Thank you. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and re-you. Thank you.